それでは、えー、RTA in Japan Winter 2022、えー、ドラゴンクエストモンスターズペリーのワンダーランドレトロの時間です。All right. Hello, hello, everybody. I am Hactical, joined here by my friend the Countess. Hello. It looks like we're getting started here with Dragon Quest Monsters Retro, which,、uh, if anyone's unfamiliar, this is a Switch port of the Game Boy Color game. So it plays a lot like the GBC version. There's some quality of life stuff they add to it, which you'll see on the sides of the screen as he plays along.、Um, yeah, and because of, the, because of some of that quality of life, we'll also get some、um, Switch specific. Tech.、Um, this is the any percent category, which should mean、um, that RNG manipulations are allowed. We'll find out very quickly whether that's the case. There is an any percent no RNG manip category.、Um, the time, the estimate time, is more in line with the no RNG manip,、um, but it does say any percent. So we'll, we'll see once we get into it. It's kind of difficult to tell with the Japanese categories where no glitches and no manipulations are sort of the standard. And sometimes, and whereas the US, any percent would mean anything goes, the Japanese might append to that to say additional things that are allowed from the norm. <laughs> right, exactly. He's got the Wadabo background. The game's got five different backgrounds you can choose from, and he's got the kind of black and white Wadabo negative. And go. All right. So, the introduce the game here. This game is、uh, from the Dragon Quest series, of course. It's、um, a monster recruitment game where you are playing as Terry, who's a character in Dragon Quest VI, but he's a child here. And、um, you're going to get whisked away to a kingdom called Great Tree, where there are monster masters who tame monsters to fight each other in the arena for the Starry Night tournament. Where the winner gets a wish of whatever he wants. And、um, gameplay wise, you'll encounter a lot of monsters from the Dragon Quest series, which is cool the more games you've played between Dragon Quest 1 and 6. Because、uh, you'll see familiar faces and get to recruit that monster that gave you so much trouble. Now he's on your team and he's your best friend and he's working for you. But、uh, yeah, here at the start, you wake up in the middle of the night, your sister tells you, oh, we gotta go to bed or monsters are gonna get us. And sure enough, you know, you wake up and a monster jumps out of your dresser and takes your sister away. Then, a second later, another pops out and recruits you as well. So, for most of this game, you're just kind of wondering where your sister is. You don't get a lot in the way of leads, except for you know, the king tells you if you win the Starry tournament, then you could make a wish to help find her. So, that, that becomes your eventual goal here. But we're taken to the Kingdom of Great Tree, which you'll see here in about two seconds why it's called that. This is the master monster tamer leading you to meet the king.、Uh, the monster Watabo recruited you to be the kingdom's representative in the Starry Tournament. Clearly, they didn't have anybody else better suited than some random kid. Yeah, no, all these people that you meet who have experience, clearly they couldn't have been the representative. <laughs> So, this,、uh, the Switch version here,、uh, worth noting, is Japanese only, unfortunately. But this、yes. is、uh, the Game Boy Color version is available in English. So, yeah, the Game Boy Color version is unfortunately the only version that's been officially localized. They also ported it to PlayStation 1, where it got a whole graphical overhaul and some more monsters added to it. Then they made a 3DS version where everything's 3D, including monster models. Again, just a complete remake. We didn't get that either. And then this Switch port with a couple of improvements made to it, we didn't get either. Though you can, you know, the Switch being region free, you can buy it off the Japanese eShop if you get a Japanese gift card.、Yep. So, right here, we should see changing message speed, saving, and a reset. And we'll be seeing a lot of this. This is to set up the first RNG manip of the run. So, the runner went up to the top of Great Tree and picked the starting、uh, slime, Slabo. And that's all he's got in his party. And this RNG manipulation does a few things.、Um, you know, it gives you a relatively short path through the first few floors. 
of the this uh, beginner gate. Um, it also prevents, like, it, it manipulates the step count so you don't get into encounters while walking around. And at the end of it, uh, he should encounter a Draki, which is the first monster he'll want to recruit. It's the Draki right here. And I don't know for sure if the manipulation guarantees the recruitment or not, but... Um, Got it, no problem that time. <laughs> well, they're clapping, so... <laughs> yeah. Guessing that's not guaranteed. I know later ones are not. I don't know a lot about uh, manipulations in this game. I know how to manipulate item drops in Monsters 2, but I'm not sure if the... I don't think the RNG works the same for random encounters in 2, so... Yeah, I don't know anything at all specific to the Switch version. Yeah, I've only watched... I watched one run from this runner. Uh, this runner has the world record, and that's the run I watched yeah. leading up to this event, just so I'd have an idea of how the Switch run flows. Um, so right now he's looking for just a level up for both characters before going on to the boss. Who's going to be our good friend, Healy, Weeman. You know, who has never done anything wrong in Dragon Quest IV. He's always very <laughs> helpful. Does exactly what he needs to do every turn. So this game is really cool in that the the gates themselves are just kind of random, um, randomly generated terrain, the puzzle pieces that it kind of puts in a certain order of a certain tile set. Um, but all of the boss rooms are taken from other Dragon Quest games. So obviously this floor looks like the cave where you encounter Healy and Dragon Warrior 4. And that's going to be a theme throughout the run is that the gates themselves are kind of just random and uh, the boss floors will be the interesting ones. And yeah, the basic general flow of the progression through this game is you go yeah. through uh, like this starting gate here and then we'll unlock the tournament where we can play against some enemy AI masters who you'll do. <laughs> yeah, so we'll play against them. Uh, Enemy AI masters who will stop. unlock. Okay, <laughs> who will unlock um, the the next gates that will be available? Yeah. So you do three fights in a row in the tournament, and then you'll usually unlock two gates at a time until the last one where you just get one. And there's also one other exception halfway through the game, where you unlock one gate with the battle rex in it, and you have to do it before you can get in the second gate in that pair. Yeah, and there are a couple of. I think there's a couple one-off gates that are not the regular ones, right? Bazaar and uh, whatever the one from the... Yeah. There's actually quite a few scissors. hidden around Great Tree, just random portals that you can walk into that aren't down in the basement like the one we just went into. There's like, I think, two in the farm. There's one in the arena, one or two in the bazaar. Uh, there's one you get for a bunch of tiny metals. Um... There's one that you can get for going down in the bottom of the well and giving a monster that knows a lightning ability to the guy who lives down there. Yeah. So this is the first of the arena battles that we'll be seeing. This is uh, G-Class. So one interesting mechanic of this game is um, when you're in the gates and actually fighting the gate bosses and all of that, you can either set your monsters to be on tactics, and there's there's three tactics. They can be offensive, defensive, or a mixed uh, strategy for support abilities. Um, but you can also do manual control when going through the through the gates. But when you're here in the arena, you have to set up your party. They can only do tactics. You can set them to offensive, defensive, or mixed, but you can't manually control what their actions are. So uh, this first this first gate here, this first arena battle, is fairly straightforward um there he just switched the tactic to offensive he wants to do as much damage as possible uh these ghosts can make you lose a turn i think he switched yeah, I... offensive although healy just healed yeah he's been moving healy back and forth i think this tournament's like it's pretty free if you've got uh all three of these monsters and they're all at least level two because healy's really durable and he can cast heal like he's got five more and he's been casting a few already 
Um, but uh, this last fight is a step up from the other two, as you'd kind of expect. The uh, zombie in particular can hit pretty hard. Um, but Slime usually has a lot of HP, but he died there. And uh, the Draki actually gets pretty good defense gains as it levels. So if you're playing this casually and you're like level 5, there's no reason why you'd lose to that. Yeah, and I think I just missed saw the tactic because it looked like he switched him back to offensive at the end. Yeah. The king wanders off. Good job. Wanders off. Busy, busy, busy. Where is he going? <laughs> Iso, Iso, Iso. Alright, so here we're going to see another RNG manip. And there's a couple of things on this floor in particular that are going to be important, or on this, uh, in this gate. The main initial goal is going to be to recruit a picky. Would be a strong bird enemy that gets some useful or bird monster that gets some useful abilities and uh birds are birds are really good in this game um we'll see a little bit more about that later and then there's going to hopefully be there should be a special floor so one thing worth noting in this run so here's the picky i'm gonna feed him some meat meat increases your recruitment chance uh but what i was gonna say about the special floors is every three floors i think it is you can get a special floor, uh, which could be a healer or an item shop, or some dungeons have unique floors. And, um, okay, so he didn't recruit the picky, so he's resetting to do that again. But the reason I mentioned the special floors is that in some of them you can save, so there will be subsequent RNG manipulations for those special floors. So. You got all the spoilers. I don't know what's going on, so I don't have a lot to say, because you're saying it before it happens. I know. But you can talk about the picky and the birds. If birds level up fast. They need two experience to hit level two. It's very fast. Uh, all the monsters in this game, like, there's uh, all of your stats and your experience. They have, like, 32 different possible growth rates different curves and for experience points when you're going to hit level two you can tell how fast you're going to go basically based on how much you need there because everybody needs either two five ten twenty or a hundred xp to hit level two if you take a hundred xp to hit level two it's probably a boss monster or one of the late dragons and they level extremely slowly but uh yeah for almost all the birds in the game are two xp to level two so they're one of the like four or five fastest curves out of all the options um, and that makes them really good in uh, this game in particular, I find, because it's very difficult to get to high levels in this game uh, before the post game because you don't have really good uh, enemies to grind on compared to what you get in Monsters 2 at the end game. And the birds um, learn some pretty good support, util support spells. Yeah. In this game. Yeah, Picky in particular, I know, gets Sap, um, yep. which you can use to lower the defense power of enemies. I think it cuts in half in this version, so if you cast it twice, uh, it'll reduce it to zero. Um, looks like he's also recruiting this gremlin here, which I assume he's just going to feed to the guy in the bazaar to open a gate. Yep. There's a guy there that, uh, there's two guys struggling to light a barbecue, and he says, Hey, can I borrow one of your monsters for a minute? And unfortunately, I'm pretty sure that's how it's translated in the English GBC version. So you may not realize that you're not getting that monster back if you give it to him. Uh, but yeah, if you give him anything that has a fire spell or fire breath, um, then it'll light the barbecue and explode, which on GBC just means it disappears, and then there's a gate underneath. Uh, yeah, and there's the other uh, bizarre gate over that you can't get to yet, it just kind of teases you. I'm not sure it opens up before the post game. <laughs> And then, obviously, we saw yet another RNG manipulation. Um, again, this is going to be for getting items. There was a map herb there, I think that was. And then a... I, I don't know the English name of the staff, uh, the one that cast Infernos. Uh, Windstaff. Okay, Windstaff. It's GBC, so everything's like five letters. <laughs> yeah. 
Like Tenbo no Tsue in Japanese, I think. Um, Sounds about right. I know it starts with Te. And, or yeah, maybe just, just Tenbo. $1,500, so. Yeah, That's how exactly. Mind translates it. And speaking of 1,500 hours, here is a shop where it's going to be sold for $1,500. Yeah, so in this version of the game, if you try to sell a staff in Great Tree, the hub, uh, they will only sell for 10% of their value, but this guy here will buy any item off of you for 100%. Um, so it's much more efficient to sell the staffs here. There's a lot of uh, like high-value items that you can get in certain conditions in these gates, and like you kind of want these shops to pop up so that you can sell them here instead of taking them to the hub. It's very crucial in any form of this run because you're going to need a big pile of money to do the last tournament at the end of the game, the second to last one, rather. Yeah, so that's the one thing that's really interesting about this run is that the tournaments all cost money to enter, which is fairly exponentially increasing when you get to the higher ranks. And so it's kind of balancing like the gates that you need, getting enough money as you go. Uh, unlocking just the tournaments you need to get to the next gate. Um, not every tournament is needed to beat the game, um, but you do need to beat quite a few of them to kind of progress through the game. So uh, money is pretty important. Safety saving before the tournaments is pretty important. And uh, those item shops will be a recurring theme. So here he found a wandering monster master who has a random team. I don't know how random it is if he's manipulating, but basically based on the total of your party's levels, there are, I don't know how many pools of monsters to pick from, but each pool has got 15 monsters in it, and then the masters will have three of those 15 monsters, and they can be duplicates. But what's cool about them... Um, well, two things. At low levels, they give very high experience drops compared to just the stuff that he's fighting here. It looks like he's taking another fight to top off a level or something. But also, the if you recruit the monsters that those Wandering Masters have, they will always have abilities that the monsters don't normally learn. So it gives you some extra move variety. Yeah, and there's a couple of spells that, that he wants here. Um, Sleep on the Drachy is going to be important for this upcoming boss, and also Sap on the Picky. Uh, yeah. Are both going to be needed. He's probably, I assume, getting them to level 10 to breed as well. Um, so, the, like, the core mechanic in this game is monster breeding, which is the monster master that uh, took us up to the king earlier. If you go talk to him after you get to a certain point in the game, you can mix together any two monsters of opposite genders that are level 10 or higher. And based on what you uh, put in, you'll get something different out. Uh, the basic combination is like uh based on the family of the monster we mentioned there's bird families here but uh for example if you mix a bird with a devil family like the demonite there you'll get a specific monster but later on uh like you get tougher monsters by breeding more specific things together like if you want the dragon lord from dragon quest one you have to breed an andriel and a great drag which are two late game monsters uh dragon monsters and, uh, yeah, so he hit level 10 there, so he's going to fight the Mad Knight here, which is another DQ1 monster. Um, we didn't mention when he went into that previous gate under in the basement of the castle that the two gates he had options to go into were also DQ1 bosses. The dragon boss was the gate that he jumped into. The one across from it would have been the golem. But I think he winged out after getting the gremlin without even fighting the dragon. So this is the other mini boss from Dragon Quest 1, the Mad Knight, who is guarding Urtrick's armor in the original game. Akuma no Kishi. Yep. <laughs> and the bosses in this game are a lot of what makes this fun to play if you've played the original main series games before. Like I mentioned, they're representatives from DQ 1 through 6. This game came out very shortly after Dragon Quest VI, so I think VI has a little more representation than some of the other games. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. So on that boss, you know, the the general idea is to set up with the slap, the sap and sleep spells that he just learned on his two monsters, um, and then you kind of just go offensive. But one of the one of the interesting things about um, the combat is that. 
you can use items in combat, and the items will always go first. And, um, but if you use an item, you can't do manual action control. You just kind of get whatever tactics they're set to. So you want to try to kind of manually do your setup or put them on a mixed um, strategy if you still need to do setup, uh, if you need to heal them with items. And then, you know, once, once you're set up, um, you know, for that boss, you can kind of just stay ahead of it by using herbs. He bought a bunch of herbs in that item shop after selling the staff earlier. We haven't really commented on what the heads-up display is doing, but you can see on the right side here, it's just listing off all the monsters that are in his team and all the stats. If he pushes L and R, there are a couple other pages you can tab to. I know one has the skills that each monster has. I'm not sure what the middle screen is um, when I was looking at it the other day. And also, uh, when you were wandering around the map, like, in my opinion, the biggest quality of life improvement, uh, when you're in the randomly generated dungeons, it shows you the mini-map on the side of the screen right there. Normally, you have to press select to bring it up. It's so much more convenient just having it there. And it also tells you how many items are left on the floor, too, which is great for casual exploration. Because if you get a full-sized map and you've collected all the items on GBC, you may not know how many are left. You may keep looking for them when... With the hint there, you can just keep going, jump in the hole, and go to the next floor. It does kind of lessen the value a little bit of the beast tail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming that still exists in this game. I don't know if it maybe reveals item locations or something like that. I'm, I'm guessing it still exists and does something, but... Yeah, well, it points to the hole, so like even if you haven't revealed the hole yet, because the yeah, map... The mini-map isn't fully revealed on the display. That's true. Alright, so now we're going to get the first uh, breeding here. He's going to breed Draki with the Devil Knight that he recruited earlier. And um, get a dead pecker. Which is another yes. bird monster. Saves coming to get the correct gender off of this. Normally, you would walk over to the, she calls herself the egg evaluator, and you would ask her what the gender is of the egg, and then you can flip it if you need to. to and that's a pretty core mechanic for breeding either in a speedrun or casually in this game, but so quick to reset there that he just reset over it. Yeah, well, we will actually see a little bit of that later. Spoiler. Uh, so we went back up to the roof and got Healy back. So um, you can only have three monsters in your party, and if you recruit more monsters, uh, you can either have them replace an existing monster on your team, or you can send them to the farm. And so a couple of the monsters swap in and out for a little while, but because he just bred two of the monsters that were in his team, he's got an open slot, so he brings the the healer back. These two gates, I believe one is the Mad Cat from DQ5, and the other one is the Face Tree, which is just a DQ2 random encounter. Um, one thing he's doing there, you see he just opened the like little switch menu. Uh, this game actually has two walking speeds. It's got a regular walking speed and a faster walking speed. And so he actually changes the walking speed in a couple of spots uh, in order to presumably affect the RNG manipulations. In this case, he wants uh, this treasure chest room where... Uh, I don't know. It looks like uh, he should have gotten a life seed and another wind staff. And I think a meat of some sort. So here he's going to save and reset. He's looking for a foreign master to fight for some XP, I think. That's what my notes say. To level up that dead pecker. And he just bred. Like yeah, here we go. Runs. <laughs> yep. Got all the strats. Um, 
So uh, again, I mentioned earlier that the monsters that these guys have are based on the sum of your monsters' levels. It does not factor in your stats. So after you breed your monsters, you actually end up with uh, basically half of the average of what the parents had. Um, but you'll be level one. So these guys will have very weak monsters that you can just kind of bully because your guys have the stats of a level five monster. <laughs> now he's going to continue through the gate down to the boss floor. Looks like he's taking some fights along the way. <laughs> Not really sure what the uh, particular XP goals or anything like that are. Uh, presumably level 10 again for breeding purposes on certain monsters uh, but there might also be spell learning thresholds that he wants to get but thankfully on this boss floor it's full of stumps he can fight so these stumps are worth quite a bit of xp relative to the monsters even in the gate like they, they give about as much xp as a encounter of three monsters from up above so it's very efficient to fight them it's kind of a similar thing in the battle rex gate later there's a bunch of eggs in there if, uh, if you've seen played dq6 it's kind of the same arena as the battle rex's room there and the monsters in those eggs give a lot of xp too I imagine he'll take advantage of that when it's time to get there. Mm -hmm. I think he actually is going to fight all of these stumps. Um, and I don't think he actually fights the boss. We'll see. Probably not. Bosses don't give XP. And I oh, yeah. don't know to recruit the face tree. That makes sense. It's also kind of annoying to fight too, because it's got a couple of different status of skills, including uh, curse, which just puts like random curses on your team. Sometimes you'll lose turns because of it. Sometimes you'll lose MP because of it. I'm not actually sure how the curse move works in this game. But... And I know it's got some other dances too. It might have Rob Dance or something else. So we just learned Bagima or Inframore and Increase. A couple of potentially useful abilities. I'm not sure exactly which ones get use, but I'm sure that uh, Inframore at least gets some use. Yeah, it's going to be pretty helpful in this fight. I think this is the arena that ends with a bunch of high defense power enemies. In which case, it's very difficult to get through here without some good healing or an area spell of your own. <laughs> kind of reiterate what this version of the game is, since I've seen some comments on it in chat. This is a port of the Game Boy Color version on the Switch that was only released in Japan, though you can buy it in the eShop if you've got a Japanese gift card and an account on your Switch, Japanese account. Um, but yeah, you can see it adds some kind of quality of life things to the side here. You can see right now he's got all the stats of his monsters on the right side, and when he's in the uh, randomly generated worlds, it shows the map and some other information. Um, this game's been ported quite a few times, but unfortunately we only got the very original Game Boy Color version of the game in the U.S. We didn't get the PS1, 3DS, or this version. And to answer the question in chat, I, I think Swoosh is the modern name for Inframore, but I don't know the modern name Incredibly. super well. <laughs> I don't know the modern name super well. It's whatever the, the mid-tier is. I'm most familiar with the Japanese names for spells. So to me, it will always be Bagima. This is the should be the final fight of this D class. Oh, it's the Mad Cat's one. I was thinking of the class above this class before this one. But this uh, one, uh, all three of these monsters do pretty good damage, and the uh, Rogue Knight does have high defense power. But you're gonna definitely want an area spell to get through this one, or the Mad Cats are gonna mess you up. Yeah, and it looked like they just uh, did. 
the AI just did increase too to buff up defense. So. Yeah. No problem clearing E class. Any HP left. <laughs> I think the Rogue Knight there also has the heal spell, though it doesn't do a whole lot compared to the damage you need to be doing to win that fight anyway. But he might have Evil Slash, which can cause a lot of problems. That's a like random chance to get a full critical hit or miss. And if it criticals one of your party members, it'll just kill them. Now he's jumping down to this this area here. This area is pretty fun, casually. Uh, pretty there's... much everybody in this area changes completely what they say every time you win a tournament match. So it's really cool to come back and talk to everybody every time. Yeah, the, uh, the guy at the bottom right is trying to teach the golem, well... I think it's in, in English, he's trying to teach the golem Japanese, and in Japanese, I think he's trying to teach him English. So it's yeah. a lot of just like language jokes. You know, wh why why do they call it sushi? Isn't it rice or so stuff like that? Um, and then the guy at the top left is telling really bad jokes, at least in English. I know one of the golem's lines in English is, What the heck is Hasami? Can't you just say, you know, about chopsticks or. Oh, yeah. Something like that. They're all worded kind of similarly to that. Yeah, the top left, there's a mirror that transforms into you and says, it makes an attempt to make a joke, but uh, they're basically Google translated in the Game Boy Color English version. They just make absolutely no sense. And there's another guy in there that's kind of trying to train his bomb crag, but it's just rolling around, not paying any attention to him. A couple other things that are just kind of they, their stories progress a little bit every time you clear. I'm pretty sure it's every time you clear an arena match. Yeah, and in the meantime, uh, he traded the picky to another NPC in town for an egg. So he's got a couple eggs now. He beat the rock, paper, scissors hand. Talk to the guy upstairs. So he's going to get a stone slime and a blizzard hawk from these eggs, and he, he did double-check the genders before hatching them, so that way he'd be able to breed them correctly later. The Stone Slime gets a very important ability called Strong D, or in later translations of the games, it's Defending Champion, where it's like uh, the Defend command in battle, except you're only going to take, I think it's 90% damage, or 10% of the damage in this version. Um, uh, from any attack, it might. In some games, it's 95 reduction, so it reduces down to 5%, but it's kind of trivial whether you're taking 5% or 10%. Um, and both of the the monsters he just made are stepping stones to a whip bird monster, which is just a bird that gets extremely high HP gains. Um, and he's probably, I assume, gonna have two of those for his final party. And then just recruit something random for his final, not random, but for his final team. Yeah. So here's another pretty big manipulation. Um, if he if he had a bunch of herbs left, he would have tossed them to clear inventory space. But he's going to get a magma staff here. Go down to the next floor and find another magma staff. We talked about staffs earlier and uh, their role with item shops. So, you know, he's going to conveniently land on another item shop. And save and reset the exact same manipulation he just did for two more magma staffs. It's noting that death is really punishing in this game. Um, you will lose all of your uh, items except for a couple very specific things, and you lose half your gold when you die. So it's very easy to get starved on gold in a casual playthrough if you walk into a gate, the monsters are too tough for you, or if you bred a bad monster or something. Someone commented in chat that, you know, if you don't know what the monster is that you're about to breed, you may end up with something weak. 
that's somewhere that uh, knowing the original main series games can kind of help you, though, because for the most part, if a monster was giving you trouble in the original games, it's going to be a strong monster in this game, too. Yeah, for sure. But you can see after getting those magma staffs and everything else that he picked up in Elf Water, the wind staff, and selling it all, he's got over 16,000 gold now. So yeah. a death would cost 8,000 gold. Yeah. yeah. And most things you're going to buy in this game only cost like a couple hundred or so. And it's not really until the very end of the game that you need more money than that. Um, but like we were saying with the cost of the arena fights, the last arena fight that you pay to enter costs 10,000, so that's where a chunk of his money's gonna go. Yep. And here he's gonna fight the dragon kids like I was talking about earlier. These guys can be a little dangerous if you've got a monster that has high physical attacks because they can sidestep, which can deflect your physical attack toward one of your party members. Uh, but it looks like he's putting them to sleep here to kind of avoid that. Yeah, and he bought a bunch of love water at that item shop, so he's got a bunch of healing items, so in between fights, yeah. recovery isn't going to be a big deal. And he just learned to heal. On the stone slime. I'm assuming the targets for this grind here are, he's obviously going to want everyone level 10, but he probably wants one or both of his newest monsters to hit 14 to learn some skills. There's a lot of skills that you learn at level 14 in this game for whatever reason. So, uh, I guess, so the way breeding works for skill inheritance is that the child will learn all of the skills that the parent would naturally learn, plus all of the skills that the parent had at the time that you bred it. Um, so if he's trying to, for example, the blizzardy, if he wants the skills that the parents of the blizzardy had to go to the blizzardy's child, he needs to learn them before breeding. Learn some and, uh, good abilities here. Yeah, a very kind of minor optimization in the routing or minor sounding is that um, since you do have to use the AI in the tournament matches in this, uh, they are going to be because you can only learn eight skills maximum. They are going to be throwing away some skills that they just don't want the AI using in battle, and there are also some other skills that the AI like. They're not useful, but the AI tends to not use them, so you just keep them to kind of fill space so they don't learn, uh, like, garbage moves. It's also worth noting that, um, it, I, I don't really know any of the explanation, and even if I did, it would be too much to talk about now, but, um, fighting these random monsters with various tactics or manual control does influence, I think, their wild stat or some sort of background uh, counter for what type of actions they're going to do in combat. So yeah, There's, like, personalities, and that's a system I'm not super familiar with, but, like, if you use charge tactics a lot offensive, then you'll get a personality that makes the monster more likely to do certain things when they're on offensive tactics, that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know how much it really applies for this run in particular, but... It can definitely be a factor with longer categories or playing casually, and you might not even realize that, you know, you tend to just kind of do manual control a lot when you play casually, but that can kind of have a negative impact sometimes yeah. on your monster's behavior. So this battle here, the Battle Rex has high attack power. It's also got Metal Slash, not that you have any Metal Slimes in your team. It's got Evil Slash that it doesn't use very often. But like I mentioned with the Rogue Knight, that's a critical hit that'll do a lot of damage to your team. And it's also got a uh, tier 2 Fire Breath called Fire Air, which is what it's mostly using here, which is hitting his whole team for about 40 damage. Um, I believe it runs out of magic after doing 8 of those, though. So he can just sit here and spam his Love Water healing items and it'll eventually stop. Um, and then he can, if I like, he'll still have the defense spell unless that was on his Stone Slime that died. And he can just stack defense power and not really be able to lose at that point. Um, but really, with enough love waters, you can beat this guy with just about anybody. He may have also used uh, earlier, uh, which I think uh, that traded for the egg. Yeah, so that's probably the stone slime then who died. I did see that he learned the surround spell, though. He might have used that on the battle rex. He's using a world leaf here to revive the dead pecker, of course, right as he wins the fight. 
He bought yeah. one world leaf in the item shop earlier. <laughs> I think he uh, evil slashed there. It hit for 64 damage. <laughs> then the battle wrecks join the team. So, um, so how does uh, like boss monsters joining you work? Are they are they guaranteed? Is it a chance? We, we didn't really talk a whole lot about recruitment chances. Do you want to maybe explain yeah. how like so, it works with me and stuff like that? Yeah, so most bosses will automatically join you. Uh, some of them uh, are not intended to join you, but you can in, uh, get them to join you by giving them meat. Uh, the basic way recruitment works is there are four meat items in the game. There's beef jerky, pork chops, ribs, and sirloins, and each one of those is more effective than the previous. And the more of those you throw at a monster, the more likely it will join you at the end of a battle. Um, though only the last monster standing will have an option of joining you. Um, and yeah, again, boss monsters, you, most of them are guaranteed, though there's a couple in the game that you can recruit through giving them enough meat. Um, and some of them will also just turn up their nose at you and not accept the meat when you throw it at them. It'll say they're not interested. Um, yeah, the Battle Rex he got is a, it joins at a pretty high level, so it's pretty useful for the next couple steps if he takes it with him. But it's got the Fire Breath I mentioned, but if you level it up one time, that Fire Breath will actually level up to become Scorching, which is uh, about 100 damage to everybody, which is very nice to have. Though he probably won't waste time leveling it up in this run, judging by how short it is. It's definitely an option in a GBC run. Yeah, so here he's gonna talk about some items. Looks like he just bought another world leaf. He's buying a bunch of world dew, making sure he saves 10,000 gold. Uh, I think he yep. bought a couple of bookmarks also, some meat. Um, the bookmarks will allow him to save anywhere later, which will be useful for more manipulations. Now he's coming down to play some more rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> so the first rock, paper, scissor game he played was in the back of the arena. Uh, the Goopy standing there opened up a portal right next to him when he won the game. Or it was a staircase, rather, that took you up to the Queen of Great Tree, who for some reason is just hiding in the arena. And that's actually kind of a cool area because at different points in the game, she'll have different guests there and a lot of them will breed monsters with you. There's like at least, I think, four people that'll breed monsters with you at different points. Though I think one's a repeat. Same guy, but a different monster he offers. Um, but then that second Rock, Paper, Scissors game will move one of the statues next to the first Goopy that has a portal under it. Yep. In the meantime, he's he just bred Whitbird number one. Or Rockbird in the Japanese translation. Yep. And again, this monster is, uh, like all bird monsters, it levels very, very quickly. It has very high defense power and very high HP as well. And he's got two of them. Yeah, and he just used the life knot that he picked up in the treasure chest room earlier on with bird B. Yeah. And so if you've played this game before, a lot of the routing for which monsters you recruit and stuff is all based on the final... Uh, boss of the game, which is not uncommon at all for an RPG speedrun. Um, the final boss is like, you know, a step up from the two bot monsters before it, which are a step up from everything before it. Like, the uh, you take a lot of AoE damage, and so you need these monsters that have very high HP, and they also resist some of the moves that are being used on you. Um, in addition, you've got that strong D attack I mentioned which is very important for trying to survive round one. You hope the AI will use that to tank one of the monsters, which uses an ability that consumes all of its magic to deal a ton of damage to everybody. Here we're bullying another level one monster tamer. <laughs> yeah, so the, the goal here is there's going to be actually a lot of fighting right now for XP for the two Whipbirds. Um, the goal is about level 16 on both of them. So, I'm going to be here for a couple minutes fighting 
this guy and then fighting some trash. The These priests are actually pretty nice to fight because they also heal you up after the fight. Yeah. yeah so the different uh, classes of these wandering masters there's this priest here and there's different ways to get each one for the priest he's kind of um i think he shows up if you pick up a lot of items on the previous floor uh but he's also kind of one of the defaults um and then he heals you at the end like hectical said um the main default is like the warrior looking guy he fought two of those earlier in the run if you beat them they just give you a warp wing and a uh item sometimes they give you an extra item which is usually either a tiny metal or something very expensive like a staff or a book um there's also merchants which in this version are really powerful um you find them by taking 200 steps on the previous floor and then uh try to avoid the conditions of the other uh, monster masters which so if you pick up a bunch of items he'll turn into a priest instead but if you take a bunch of steps without ta uh, picking up items you'll get the merchant and when you beat the merchant he fills up your inventory with random meat items which can be very good money if he gives you a bunch of sirloins um and in later versions of the game they actually merch nerfed the merchant i think on the ps1 version he always gives you four meats instead of filling you up because you've got 20 inventory slots in this game so if you dump all of your non-necessary items you could get like 17 18 meats off of them um there's also a bard which is probably the rarest uh monster master to run into because to find him you have to be in pretty specific gates this gate can do it but you need to be on a screen that only has two uh i guess screens worth like a floor that has two screens worth of tiles on it um a lot of the floors in this gate are four screens uh which is one of the reasons why it's appealing to be in here right now um, but beating the bard will give plus 20 to each of your monsters lowest stats basically um, Some of the stats have strange weightings to them like I think agility or intelligence it looks at uh, Half the value or twice the value or something before it picks those um, And I think the only other monster master is the wizard and to find him in this version you have to have a map that is 16 screens so a 4x4 four four, and um he will, when you beat him, he'll warp you 20 floors down, which is very nice. I'm sure there's going to be uh, at least one wizard later in the Gate of Reflection, because that gate is 26 floors to get through. So having him skip 20 of them for you is very speed efficient. Wizard. Unless he just manipulates to just get in the hole every time. So another question, um, how important are the stats on the Whipbird? So I'm looking at the screen right now, I see that Whipbird A has 89 attack, has 172 agility, and Whipbird B is a much lower attack and much lower agility. Um, you know, in the routes that you've done, is that like a big impact that you have one main attacker and the other one's more utility, or is he getting bad luck with these level ups, or... The level ups do not have any randomness to the stats at all, so the stats are going to be the same every time. But as far as the routing goes, I would say the skills matter more than the stats, especially with how high you level the birds. They're going to be fairly close, and they're not going to be strong enough to like punch out the king metal at the end of the game. Um, gotcha. But yeah, the only uh, difference in their stats is just the difference in what the parents had, because like I said... To, when you breed a monster, it averages the stats of the parents and then cuts in half, and then that's what the child starts with at level one. Makes sense. So probably relatively consistent between runs, considering. Yeah. Especially with the manipulations. I assume that manipulations uh, also manipulate some stats, whether intentionally or otherwise. Yeah, it's possible. It's kind of hard to say because I see that recruitment isn't guaranteed when he's manipulating. So, yeah, sure. And I, the stats are determined uh, when you recruit the monster. Ah. So, but I'm kind of guessing this game has multiple like random number systems going on in the background. So maybe the stats generator doesn't use the same one that the recruitment chance uses. Interesting. Level 15 there, the Whipbirds both learned Iron Eyes, which would be great if they would actually use it, but they don't. 
That's an ability that freezes your whole team for three turns, and then meanwhile you can't take any actions, but you also take no damage, and that would be great for absorbing the Mega Magic spell in the final fight of the game. Right. But we gotta yep. settle for strong D. Throughout this whole grind, there's been a lot of skills that have been learned and overwritten, and it's gone by yeah. way too fast to follow, so I don't know exactly what he's trying to specifically keep or get rid of, but it kind of just feeds back into what Countess was saying earlier, where you want to teach the useful abilities, you want to keep some dummy padding abilities that hopefully the birds won't use, and you want to get rid of abilities that you don't want them to use. So... But he's got level 16 now, and uh, now he's bouncing out of there. Getting the battle wrecks back, and uh, time for S class. Like I said, you can optionally take the battle wrecks with you for that grind, but it slows it down because your experience points are split between how many monsters you have with you. So the uh, what he's got is like the bare minimum for what like a world record attempt might try for GBC. But since you can save and reset and manipulate easier in the Switch version, he's probably gonna have a little comfier time here. But on GBC, I usually get the whippers from up to at least 20 or 21, so that they get a stronger breath attack as well. I see. And then leveling up the Battle Rex once gives him a skill, uh, a scorching. Does the well the Battle Rex will gain some XP from all of that, even though he's in the farm, right? Ten percent of what's what the party's gained, or something like that, or yeah, it's like seventeen percent or something strange like that. It might be one eighth, but um, monsters in the farm do not learn skills, so he even if he did level oh. up off it which is, he won't because he's a dragon at level 20. Um, he wouldn't upgrade his fire breath. Gotcha. You can see the whip birds have 270 HP each now. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think they have the same HP growth that grizzlies have on their strength, which is at, in the first 20 or so levels, it's the highest growth. Um, like I mentioned, there are 32 values, so in the background you've got a number between 0 and 31 determining your growth, and I think it's 26 is what they have for HP. The main um, team. <laughs> there are some uh, growth curves that get higher HP at later levels, like if you go up to 40 or 60, but if you're just going to 20 or 30, this is the one that gives you the most. Uh, one notable skill I see one of them cast is Heal All, fully recovers one uh, of his monster's HP. Yep, should have Sleep, Surround, the Flame Breath, obviously. Boom, Yora. This fight here is really silly. There's a Metabol on the far left, which is what you expect it to be if you've played the main series. It's a metal slime with like 7 or 8 HP, you can't really hurt it except with specific attacks. However, the Robo Drac on the far right has the Massacre ability, which is a critical hit that's completely randomly targeted, including his own team, including himself. So you're hoping here that the uh, Metal Drac will take care of the Metabol for you. Alternatively, uh, it's too late now, but alternatively you can hope that the Battle Rex uses Evil Slash and takes it out. That's yeah. what happened in the record run. The Battle Rex took it out. But Battle Rex is taking a nap. Yep. He should be fine here. It looks like his heal all is keeping up with the damage they're doing. The Metal Babble, by the way, is casting Explode at every turn, which is like a 120 damage explosive spell. There goes the Babble. Ah, uh, yeah, there was Massacre from the Robo Drag. And the Robo Drag took himself out. All right, thank you. <laughs> it's the MVP. Everyone's clapping for him. <laughs> S class casually is incredibly difficult. Like, I know that, oh, just grind up a couple birds and take it out seems really easy. Um, it's not. Uh, yeah. Every. every the, the veggies in the first group do KO Dance. 
the the meme team of the slime and the Draki and the army ant and the B team in the middle fight have like really high HP, a lot of AOE damage, and then yeah, that that final fight is just like the metal drat can can massacre you. The exploit at every turn is tough to deal with. Just really, really difficult arena fight. And it's very difficult to get AoE healing in this game without looking up a guide. Not very many monsters get it. Though the heal slime you get at the beginning can learn it, you have to basically keep it a heal slime until it gets high enough stats to learn it. Because it comes at a late level, and also you need really high magic and intelligence to learn it. So, like, uh, he is currently using one of his whippers as a descendant of the healer, but since he bred it too early, it's not going to pass on the heal -less ability. Because he didn't learn it on the stone slime. Uh, comment in chat about leveling after farm leveling. Uh, you kind of catch up on skills. I believe your skills can only evolve once per level up, though. So if you sat in the farm from like level 1 to level 95 uh your first level would give you you know the level 2 spells next level would give you level 3 etc i guess you'd get level 1 first but, uh, yeah this final gate uh, gate of reflection uh like i mentioned earlier this is a 26 floor gate so i'm assuming he's gonna be getting a wizard in here to jump down 20 floors we'll see Something else we're going to see in here, too, from the manipulations. He's going to get down to a certain floor, and he's going to use those bookmarks that he found. Um, one of them, I think, is probably to get a wizard, but there's another monster recruitment he's going to want first. Because Battle Rex, Battle Rex is good, but Battle Rex is not quite Starry Night material at the moment, so. Yeah, even if you leveled him up a couple of times, he just isn't good enough for this. There's a couple of options for what you can get as your last monster in here. Um, we'll wait and see what uh, he actually ends up recruiting. But another option is, at the end of this, we're going to be fighting Durin from Dragon Quest VI. And it goes kind of the same way as the fight in Dragon Quest VI goes. First, you start off fighting two servants, um, which are the skeleton dudes with four arms. And you can actually recruit one of those. And that's kind of cool because if you get lucky on their stat rolls, they can actually have enough attack power to kill the King Metal in the final fight. Um... But he's going for a more consistent option here. Yep, so one bookmark to save scum the manip, and the second bookmark here to save before the fight. And it's the Mimic. Yep. These guys show up a lot in some of the late the late game gates in this game. Like when you're playing casual, you'll just be like, oh a treasure chest. I need I need gold. I need to be able to afford the tournament. And nope, it's just another mimic. Yeah. Uh the chest rooms also they tend to show up in. I think. Yeah, and the first time you run into them, they're about as rough as the first time you find them in Dragon Quest Three. Like they've got Blazemore, and you've got barely enough HP to survive it on your toughest monster. And they chomp pretty hard too. And he got the mimic recruit. Right. Everyone's clapping. Need to refresh. I'm like four seconds behind you. There we go. Yeah. And here's his wizard. Wizard. Yora. Yeah, both of his whippers have the boom spell because uh, I believe whipper natively gets bang. And mimic here with blaze most. Yep. Yeah, mimic's got. Lots of MP, strong magic. I know it's got Blaze Most and Defeat. I'm not sure if Defeat comes in handy at all. 
don't know. Save him before the boss. I stopped watching the record. It can be really rough in a casual playthrough. These servants like to spam Blizzard, which does just a ton of ice damage to you. If they both cast it, it really hurts. They can also do Blaze Most, which is about the same damage, but it's single target. It's what the Mimic just used there. Um, and their physical attack does a lot of damage too. Right now they're both spamming Blaze Most, Meira Soma. Yeah, this was the point where I stopped watching the record because I'm like, ah, Countess knows how the end of the game goes. Yeah, it's probably no surprises from here. He's set up pretty much the same way you would be in a GBC run. And like I mentioned, I think if you throw like two or three sirloins at those guys, you can recruit one of them as your last monster. Mimic, I think, is just a little faster. So this is... is the Mimic any more reliable for taking out the Metal King? Uh, no, it doesn't have enough attack power to beat the Metal King. I assume it's just, like, primarily faster than getting the Servants, and uh, less defeat helps. I don't think it's got another advantage over the Servant besides that. Mm. It also looks like it has more HP than the Servant. I don't think the servant is over 300. Um, yeah, this fight here is... His name is Terry with a question mark, just the same as your character, but with a question mark, because it's your future self, supposedly. Um, in Dragon Quest VI, when you beat Durin, he's got Terry working for him, and that's how you recruit Terry onto your team. So they kind of worked it into the story of this one. You're going into the Gate of Reflection to fight your alternate self, I guess. Got Crispy Terry here, eating lots of fire attacks. Um, unfortunately, he bought all those healing items earlier, so it's making this fight a lot safer. Um, Terry pretty much just has three slash attacks. I think it's Bolt Slash, Vacuum Slash, and I'm not sure. I think Rain Slash is the other one, which hits your whole team. Um... I think that's right, yeah. A little bit of damage. So you're with this much HP, all you really have to worry about is if he hits you with rain slash and you don't heal it, then you might need to watch out. If he does one or two more, then you might be in range for him to kill you with something else. The difficulty of this really ramps up a lot too. Like Countess mentioned how hard this fight is casually, and like you can see it here. He's spitting out Blazemos every single turn and Blazemores every turn, and that fight still took a long time. Yeah. And it's only the second fight. You got the servants, you got Terry. Now Durin, who actually is, like, I don't know if I'd say he's harder than Terry, because he's vulnerable to a couple of things that Terry isn't. You can actually stun him with certain abilities. Um, you can lower his defense more easily than Terry's, too. I think that's what he just used on him. Yep. So, once you get set up, this fight's not too dangerous, but before you get set up, he does have a lot of damage that he's throwing out here. He's using a consumable item right now that heals the whole team, the World Dew item. And I saw he's got at least two more in his inventory, which he may as well use here, because this is the last fight where those will even be important, since you can't use them in the tournament match. Buffing up his defense now. I think all of the damage this guy can do will be reduced by raising your defense power. If you just stack a bunch of that, then he gets safer. Yes, yes, yes. to have one move that's not, I'm not sure about vacuum. Alright, put him to sleep. Got a surround off, I think. More defense increasing. Yeah, might have been Lure Dance instead of Sleep, which is just a one-turn stun, but you can do oh. it over and over. I know he's also vulnerable to Lush Licks and Sick Lick, the latter of which will also reduce his defense power to zero. I've used that in some runs before. World Dew. 
This fight, the mimic's not doing a whole lot because it's completely out of magic. It's just kind of popping them. Yeah, although with the defense lowered, like, it's still some damage and the animation's pretty quick, so... Yeah. Probably is, might still be slower than if he had magic left, but, uh... The animations of spells can be a little bit slow, so... Always something to consider in runs like this. I think Durin actually does give XP, so uh, he does want to keep his monsters alive. Most of the bosses do not. He may actually get a bonus level out of it if the Mimic dies. Yeah, he got 10,000 off of that. Good XP. Couple more levels. I saw before his last world do the mimic was getting really low and it didn't look like he was gonna heal it. I think he probably wanted it to die there near the end of the fight to maybe get an extra level on the whip birds for a little extra health or damage. Oh, well, maybe. Because the mimic comes at max level. Um, the max level in the way that works in this game is like I think each individual monster has a specific max level uh, in its data table. But then as you breed, the max level actually rises. Um, you get this little plus number put next to your monster in the status screen, and that as you breed more and more, that plus number always goes up, um, and it, that gets added to your max level, basically. I don't think it does anything besides raise your max level. It's just kind of an indicator of how many times you've bred to get the monster you've got. So, so, so. Time for the starry tournament. It's gonna head straight to the arena. There's gonna be three fights in this, just like all the other tournaments. Uh, he doesn't have to pay to enter this one. It's an invitation only tournament. By winning S class, you got the invitation. And who's he gonna be fighting in this tournament? Uh, the representatives from the other kingdoms, which are all also named after trees. There's. I know the second one's Dead Tree and the last one's Great Log. I'm not sure what this guy's kingdom is named. You only hear the name in the fight, like right before this fight. But, um, th so this fight here, there's a Centosaur, Orochi, and then another guy died. Who cares? I think Defeat must have taken them out from the Mimic, because that was pretty quick to kill them. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of physical damage in this fight, and also the Orochi has Scorching, but killing two of them with defeat is going to speed things up. The second fight is much more annoying. It's, uh, see it in a second, but the fight coming up is going to be an Andriel, which is a Dragon Quest IV dragon, a uh, Unicorn, and a um, Mad Dragon again. Um, so the Andriel has Poison Breath, which is just annoying. It's hard to keep your HP maxed out for the last fight if you get poisoned by that thing. The Unicorn can revive any of the other two monsters, which is really obnoxious. And the Mad Dragon, once again, has Massacre, like the Robo Trek curly. So... Okay, Mad Dragon's gone, so we don't have to worry about that, but he could have just bopped any one of our teammates with Massacre to instantly kill them. So right now he's probably going to play defensive. It looked like he might have stunned the Andriel. He's going to hope to end this fight with as much HP as possible. He's in a good spot right now. The Mimic doesn't do a whole lot in the last fight. Ah, he took some damage there, which is unfortunate. And more damage. It's casting a level 3 wind spell right now. Uh, Infermost. Yeah, Boggy Cross or Infermost. Kush Swooshalmost. <laughs> yeah, he went defensive there for a little bit to try to top off, but it looks like one of his monsters decided to kill it instead. Yeah, Whipper B's not super great, and Whippered yeah. Or Whippered A, I mean. Mimic's a little low too. I think in this route he only has one strung D. I'm not sure which of his birds it's on. Hopefully it's the low one. 
The Mimic's probably going to die turn one or turn two, uh, because the first turn of this fight, there's a King Metal that's going to cast a Zap for about 70 damage to everybody. The Kotal usually does Explodet for about 80 or 90 damage to everybody. And then the Rainhawk on the far right uses Mega Magic, which it can only do once, but it will do a ton of damage to everybody. And noteworthy, the reason I asked the question about who you're fighting earlier is suddenly this representative is your sister that you've been looking yeah. for this whole game. We found her, so who needs the wish now? <laughs> okay. So the Mimic actually cast a feat and killed the Kotal, so I think we are in there. Survive the... Like, if you survive the first two turns, you're usually good. Um, and once the Kotal's gone, the fight's just completely free. So this King Metal has, I think, 8 HP. You gotta chip it down one at a time. But uh, there's no chance that it kills him at this point. Yeah, this fight... This fight and S-Class both are, like, casual run killers. They're speed run killers there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't seen a Game Boy Color breeding route that gives you a like favorable chance in this fight, in this gauntlet of three fights, I should say. And the run finishes at 108.22, which is... Uh, uh, 30 minutes underestimate? Very, very fast. <laughs> yeah, it's like half my Game Boy Color PB. So, for a comparison... The run that I was watching to base, like to take some notes for commentary for this on, was from a week ago, tagged as WR at 109.45. So oh. I think this is the world record. Uh, <laughs> uh, by over a minute. Thing. So, yeah. Very little went wrong in this. I think... Uh, that Starry Night in particular was really fast with all those defeats hitting. Yeah. And he did reset over any boss fights, I think. Just a couple of, uh, like, couple boot minutes. up the game, see the wrong map, and restart, yeah. Yep. So yeah, that was, that was an insane run. Wow. I wasn't really looking too closely at the timer, besides that it seemed well underestimate, but... Yeah, I noticed World. it like 20 minutes ago, and that seemed pretty low to me, but then, uh, yeah, 108, that's really fast. Yeah, it looks like a really fun run. Like, I tend to be pretty indifferent to RPGs with, like, heavy RNG manipulation in them. Um, but, like, this run moves so quickly, and the vanilla game has so much RNG without manipulating that I can yeah. definitely see having a category where you can make it a little bit more consistent and focus on executing your menus and executing your movement and all that, like, could be just as or more fun than the <laughs> throw the dice to the wind and hope they come up, you know, with good rolls. Um, it seems like a really cool run. Yeah, unfortunately, Warabo showed up and stole our sister again, so we still have to wish to find her, but that's fine. I guess we can use our wish on that. <laughs> I liked the chat recommendation of wishing for a localization. <laughs> I want a localization of the PS1 version. That's the most gorgeous version of this game. I don't even want the 3DS version. Give me the PS1. The PS1 version looks really great. It has really good like enemy sprites and really good animations. And it's Monsters 1 and 2 on one disc. Yeah, both versions are two at that. Yeah, why couldn't we have gotten that? All we got is the Game Boy Color. For both, for both games, Monsters 1 and 2. Now, this is a Switch version. They released this, uh, it says 2019 on the layout, but it's basically the GBC version. Uh, but you can see in the margins there, there's some quality of life stuff they had on the sides. So you can see some details about your party or the map that you're on. There is some other Switch game that did that recently, and I've been struggling to remember which game it was. 
There are a few. Um, there's a lot of like the the Sega Ages collections, like the original Fantasy Star game, for example. There's yeah. a few games that have had similar things. 